Hey everybody, this is Phil Town. This is Danielle Town. And welcome to Invested, the Rule One podcast. We're going to be talking about Rule One of investing, which is don't lose money. We're going to be talking about events today and yeah. values, I think, a little bit. Well, I, I realized we, we, I'm jumping over, we, we started talking about an acronym, RULER. Yeah. Where you have, uh, you find a stock, you want to know where it's coming from, that's the radar, how to get on your radar. Then do you understand it? Are you capable of understanding the, what we'd call the meaning of the business? How does it all fit together in the industry? It's moat, that's how durable it is. The management team and the ultimately the margin of safety, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then you need to be sure you love it, you like the business, it connects with your values. And we sort of jumped over that in kind of keeping with these four M's, meaning, moat, management, margin, and safety. We're going to come back to that. To the values. Part. To the values, because yeah, it's I mean, huge. It sounds so huge. Uh, yeah, let's skip. Let's it's, let's focus on the basics. Yeah, let's stay with the basics. Because I think you informed me last time that I had training wheels, which is not my favorite um, <laughs> visualization right now. But you know, all right. Training wheels are very good, though. When I you start doing it. this on your own, you'll be glad you've got them. <laughs> um, it it it's it's a big world that you can put money into out there, and there's a lot of ways to do it wrong, and that's mostly what people do. So you're you're kind of in an apprenticeship here of learning how to do it the way the best investors in the world do it. And mm-hmm. why not? If you're going to learn to invest, why not? Learn the way the best guys do it. Yeah, tell me. I mean, none of us have time to waste, right? Like, <laughs> we don't have time to waste, and most people don't. Most people aren't fortunate enough to make so much money that a 4 or 5% return in the stock market from putting money into the stock market in 401ks or, or IRAs where a four or five percent return is going to get you the retirement you want to have. Hmm. All right, we want more financial security than that. Not only that, but we all know that if we put our money into 401ks and mutual funds uh, in IRAs, that if this market goes to pieces, your investment goes to pieces with it. And we focus on rule number one, not losing money. So we want to make sure that we're investing in companies when the market goes down, it doesn't hurt us in any way. Hmm. That's hugely important. So this is very Warren Buffetty 101 stuff. And we're going to come back to how we connect our values in with the values of the business and how you would know what the values of the business are, whether they're walking their talk, and how you know what your values are, which is a big deal, right? But that's later. That's later. Okay. Let's talk about events. Yeah, events are huge. So we got down to R for radar, U for understand the business, L for love it, and we're at the E, which is events. And events are what makes it possible for us to even believe that we could buy a company on sale. So let's go back to what Ben Graham calls the three most important words of investing. And that is margin of safety. Hmm. In other words, we want to buy a business at a significant discount to its real value. So we have to do all this other stuff to figure out the real value. So let's stipulate, my favorite new word, that we know that this is a good company and we understand it well enough to figure out the value of the business, all right? And then in the process of looking at our our moat uh, view of the business, we start to look at these big four growth rates and we figure out that this company has historically grown at a certain rate over a certain period of time. So we've seen that historically. Now what we need to understand is that if all that was required in order to figure out good companies and make a lot of money investing was to just look historically, you remember librarians would be all rich. (laughs) (laughs) They just read it in a book. But it's you got to look out the front window of the car and out that window it's pretty foggy so we're just using the historical stuff to get an idea of what the road might look like ahead but ultimately we have to know enough about the company that it has this intrinsic characteristic that allows it to keep going down a straight road that's why that's so important is it tells us that the road ahead is probably pretty straight now the word probably Mm -hmm. is key Mm -hmm. right because we're putting our hard earned money into here and we're not going to do very many of these so we're not going to be massively diversified so if we make a mistake it's going to really sting and since we're human and we're not geniuses what we have to do is follow what warren buffett's teacher taught him which is as i said the three most important words of investing we must buy this business 
with a big margin of safety to what we think it's worth. And then if we're wrong about what it's worth, we can probably still exit this and not lose our money. That's huge. One of my favorite guys is Monash Prabrai, B-A-B-R-A-I, right? Great investor. He calls this getting a free lottery ticket. He calls buying stocks with or buying companies with a margin of safety? A free, a free lottery, lottery ticket. ticket. Okay. So if you get the right margin of safety, all you've got is upside. If you win the lottery, you win a ton. If you don't win the lottery, this ticket was free. Hmm. And why is it free? Because you can unload this company for what you paid for it anytime. Yeah, got it. Okay? Yeah. So that's huge. I'm so glad that makes sense to you. Because it people either get this or they don't ever get it. Well, I mean, I get it. The, uh, the keyword is probably. Yeah. Because things happen. Yeah. Even events happen that probably would take the price below the margin of safety price. Mm -hmm. Like that's possible. Yep. That's and so let's talk about how weird it is that you should be able to occasionally find a great company. Remember, this is a great company. This is an obviously great company. So all those guys who went to Wharton and Harvard could see it's a great company. Okay. So why would they sell something worth ten dollars for five bucks if they know it's worth ten and they know it's a great company? Why would they ever do that? It would be kind of insane. Okay? So we have to think about the way the world would work in a way that that would not look insane to otherwise really smart people. All right? So here well, we But it also probably depends on your outlook as far as how long you're going to keep that company in your portfolio. Hugely. Because aren't I, I think you're thinking of like hedge fund managers who have a three-month turnaround. Mutual fund managers, mostly a three-month turnaround. Mutual fund managers. Yeah. Hedge fund guys tend to stay into things longer if they do what I do. But again, most of them don't. Most of them invest the way most all of the big guys invest. And that is they're in it for a relatively short period of time. So what would make somebody be willing to sell something really cheap is if they thought that that thing was going to get cheap really fast and they were going to get stuck with it cheap during that three month period and then it might not be it might not come back in three months right so we can see that could happen all the time yeah right sure so let me give you a, a concrete example of um, of a company that we bought so the Arab Spring started in Egypt, mm -hmm. and um, and what happened was, people who speculate on the price of cotton, cotton futures traders, got the people who own the cotton futures, right? They had the right to buy to get the cotton at a certain price. Those guys started to chortle. Whoa! They started to chortle. They were chortling. <laughs> They were like, Whoa. I, have not, I have not heard that word in a long time. They, they begin, you know, they begin to curl their mustaches. Whoa. Because why? Because if Egyptian cotton doesn't get harvested, the cotton futures I own at a price of eighty-five cents are going to explode to two dollars, and I will be able to sell that for two dollars and make a fortune. It's Eddie Murphy in Trading Places, right? So. Mwahaha, we're cornering the cotton market. Why, why is that so evil? Oh, I'm just laughing because these oh. guys are portrayed, portrayed as evil bastards all over the place in movies. Okay. You know, speculating and, 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 and just not being doing anything useful, right? So these guys are speculating. And so as they start to chortle, mwahaha, somebody comes in and says, hey, man, I'll give you 90 cents for that thing you paid 85 cents for yesterday. And he goes, no way. I want a dollar. <laughs> and the guy says, fine, here's a dollar. And suddenly the price is not 85 cents anymore, it's a dollar. Yeah. And that happened in like one day. And then over a period of about two or three months, the futures prices of cotton were pushed up by the chartering to $2, over $2 a pound, hmm. which was an insane price. I mean, you can't buy $2 a pound cotton and make t-shirts for Walmart because Walmart won't pay you for those. Yeah. Because they can't sell them. They can't sell them. The t-shirt the, the prices are pretty inelastic. 
So there's a really good company run by a really good guy who uh, comes out and he says, hey, I just want to inform you all who are tracking our stock that these cotton prices are crazy for us and we're going to lose money for the next year or so. But then everything will work itself out because Georgia, if, if Egypt stops planting cotton because they're in a revolution, Georgia will plant cotton all over the place and it only takes a, one season for them to come up with a lot of cotton, more cotton than we can ever use, and then prices will come back to 85 cents, then we're back in business and we can keep making t-shirts for Walmart. Mm -hmm. So this company is called Gildan. They're a, uh, a Canadian company. And I found out it got on my radar because I track some websites that track this kind of stuff. And I'll teach you guys that. track about that. events like this. Yeah, that track events like this. They, they'll publish it that, ooh, hey, guys, the CEO of Gildan just said he's going to eat it. Yeah. And that makes a headline. Totally. You know? And so here's the, the, the rules of the game. All of the fund managers who own that stock at $45 a share now realize that what he just told them was that this thing is going to go down like a brick. Mm -hmm. Why? Because all of their peers are going to sell it. Because he just told them, it's we're not going to make the profits that we were talking about earlier. And if they don't make the profits on a month, quarter by quarter basis, then they're going to get sold off. And so really, it's like everybody's in a crowded theater. And you see a guy stand up and start walking for the back. And you know this guy's really good at smelling smoke. And so you go, hey, man, where are you going? He goes, oh, I'm just going out to get some popcorn. And you're, like, you're thinking, that's a bunch of crap. He doesn't even like popcorn. I think I'll go with him because maybe he smells smoke. And so they start to exit the theater. And pretty soon it becomes a momentum that happens that everybody starts to realize, wow, smart people are getting out of this now because of this cotton problem. We don't know when it's going to be resolved. And the CEO said it's going to be a problem. So we got to get out of here. We'll put our money somewhere else. Well, and probably for some of those people, it doesn't even matter what the reason is. It's just, it's no, it's everybody's getting out. Everybody and getting we out. we can't afford to have something on our quarterly report that says that this company went down. Very it good. It why. Very good. That's exactly right. It doesn't matter why. We're judged quarterly. And if everybody's getting out, we got to get out with them. And, you know, we'll figure out what happened later. And so you end up with this stampede out of the theater. That's a crazy way to think about businesses. Isn't it? I mean, I, literally, I mean that in the literal sense, that's crazy. Crazy, crazy. Because it says that the market is only short-term rational. It's that, That's a rational thing to do if you think a theater might be on fire is to get the hell out. Right. But if you, if you sit back a second and say, wait a second, this theater's not on fire. This company's gonna be fine. A year from now, prices will be back where they were. It's all good then you wouldn't stampede out of there. But these guys are very short-term profit-oriented, and they don't want to get left behind to their peers. Because it doesn't matter if you're making money for people. What matters is you're doing as good as everybody else, even if oh, they're losing. So that's an interesting thing to say. Yeah, it's crazy. So that's what's crazy. In fact, how, what's really insane is that there's a whole theory of the way the stock market prices stocks that has been around since the 1960s and became the paradigm of the way the market really works in big capital letters it was developed originally by some guys in the 1950s but what really made it take off is some guys at the University of Chicago who put out this thesis that said really it would make no sense for a really smart hedge fund manager to sell a stock worth $10 for $5. Therefore, he wouldn't ever do that. And it would make no sense whatsoever in a rational world for a fund manager who's a smart guy to buy a stock for $10 if it's only worth five. On what planet would a smart guy from Wharton do that stupid deal? And so what they basically were saying is the market is really efficient. That is, People will only pay the value of the thing they're buying. So price and value are the same thing. This is a fantasy that took over academia. And everybody got taught this for the last 30 or 40 years, that the market is efficient and price is value. Well, right, because you, I think, could make the argument that once someone decides to sell it at that price, then that then becomes the value. 
Yeah, you could make that argument. Right. Well, isn't that part of the efficient market theory yeah. hypothesis? It exactly is. So that's their argument. Yeah, that's Whatever their argument. Whatever somebody is willing to sell it at. Whatever uh, that the, the only value. value of a business is what people are willing to sell. Whether it's like or not it's based on smartness or information or any of that that's not the point of that's it. Not the, point the point is it. if they'll sell it. Exactly. In other words, businesses are just like Picassos. It's only worth what somebody's willing to pay. Hundred million today, fifty million tomorrow. So it makes them into commodities. Essentially. The problem is that businesses have this unique capacity to actually produce cash flow. Picasso doesn't produce cash flow. And so the, you start to realize that businesses have an intrinsic value that's apart from whatever the market wants to pay for it. Hmm. Right? This is what Warren Buffett, what Ben Graham discovered, and then Warren Buffett put into practice with Charlie Munger and guys like me ever since, is recognizing that businesses have some value apart from whatever the market wants to say it is because they produce cash. That's very different than a piece of dirt or a Picasso. Very, very different. So what in fact occurs is that the market, far from being this coldly rational place, actually is more from time to time like a crowded theater where somebody smells smoke. That there's a lot of emotion around getting out of a market when there's a lot of momentum and downward pricing and a lot of emotion getting into it when everything's going up. And that's why you'll have people do stupid things like buy Yahoo at 11,000 times earnings or sell Gildan when it's worth, you know, they were selling it when it got down to $15, they were still selling it even though it was worth far more than that in the it's long run. It's misaligned incentives. I mean, the incentives of oh, those fund cool managers thing. are completely different than the incentives of somebody running that company, which are completely different than the incentives of a long-term value investor like Warren Buffett. Yeah. So everybody's looking for something different. Yeah. And everybody's getting something different. Very good. And that explains why they would sell and buy differently. Very good. Well, what gets really crazy is your 401k portfolio and all of your mutual funds are pretty much run based on this theory called modern portfolio manage or modern portfolio theory, MPT, which is essentially so locked into the way the whole system works that if when I took a financial advisor exam, the SEC really requires you to put in that this is a rational market. Now here's where it gets really, really interesting for a small investor, is that this whole idea of efficient market theory and the modern portfolio theory, that price is equal to value, says that in order to get a higher rate of return, you have to take more risk. Hmm. Now we get into the risk conversation. Yeah. So when you go to your advisor, they're only gonna give you they're going to give you a little 10 point exam and the, the questions will basically lead you into an answer about these things. Would you be okay? Would, do, you, do you want to take low risk and are you willing to take a low return? Or do you want to take high risk and are trying to try to get a high return? That's, that's what those exams are about. There is no question that says what everybody would want. <laughs> would you like to have low risk and a high return? And high return. <laughs> Where's that question on the exam? Because that's what I want. I want low risk and a high return. And Warren Buffett has been saying for 50, 60 years, and Charlie Munger's been saying it, that investing is really very simple. You go after a very low risk deal and you want a high return. So Manesh Pabrai put it in those terms as a free lottery ticket. You want no downside and a big upside. That's what you're shooting for as an investor in this strategy we're talking about. Very, very different. And as far as the SEC is concerned, there's no such thing. Would it be correct to say that it's an event-based strategy? It is. In fact, that's exactly what we say in our hedge fund. It's, we're event-driven. You know, we're going to sit in cash until an event comes along that makes the fund managers act rationally short-term, but irrationally long-term. We're going to take advantage of that long-term irrationality, buy this $10 bill for 5 bucks and then we're gonna camp out on it. And either the $5 bill will take us out of the market itself, that is, we will be able to reduce basis from dividends and buybacks, or this thing will go back to its value eventually when the smoke clears and there was no fire. Either way, we're gonna make money on this investment because we got in at such a big margin of safety to value because of this event. Probably. Probably. 
Probably. low risk is not the same as no risk. Right. Low risk is not the same as no risk, but it's a lot better than putting your money in a mutual fund where you constantly have this market risk of having everything go down by 50%. We've had that happen twice in the last 15 years. God, I know. Twice! This, so you this is why everyone my age doesn't want to invest in the stock market because we've seen, first of all, our jobs disappear. The last thing we want to see is our retirement. Not that any of us have any retirement savings, but if we did, we would not want to see it disappear. I know, and it's, it's heartbreaking to see people who've worked their whole lives get to age 65 or 70 and retire, not really having the ability to come back and earn any kind of real money anymore. You know, McDonald's, Walmart greeter or something is the only thing in the cards. So they really need to hold on to that retirement capital. And son of a gun, right then the market does one of those every five to seven year drops for 50%. And they're terrified because if they stay in there, it might not come back for a long, long time. Maybe it gets reduced. And they inevitably people get caught up in the emotion and they sell off at the bottom, right? How do you know the bottom's there? Everybody agrees nobody can make money in the stock market. <laughs> so we need to move our money out somewhere else, right? Now you know the bottom's in. And so people have done that. They got out in 2009 and they didn't get back in again, right? And I mean, 2009 is when we were getting back in, not when we were getting out. You know, we were getting out in 2007 when it was crazy pricing. Mm -hmm. So what we wanna do is we wanna focus on first reducing that risk by knowledge about the business. So that's why Charlie is so insistent on being capable of understanding. Second, we wanna be able to see through the fog bank far into the future. And the only way to do that is if the business has some kind of intrinsic characteristic that you know is gonna come back into gear, right? So Gildan, for example, has this intrinsic characteristic of being the low cost producer of t-shirts. They, they provide 30% of the market. So they're the, they've got this huge moat. And because nobody can do it better than they can, nobody can do it cheaper than they can. And so they got a brand and they got a moat. And so they've got this thing that says the road ahead might be bumpy for a little bit here because of this, you know, the problem with cotton prices, but it'll straighten out and it has for 10 years in the past. And so that tells us we have low risk at a certain price. Hmm. And that's why Ben Graham says margin of safety, three most important words of investing. That's why Manesh Babri is saying, get free lottery tickets, okay? So we gotta talk about what is margin of safety? What, is that, what does that mean? So we gotta stipulate, we understand this business well enough to know that Gildan is gonna go out and continue on being the best t-shirt producer in the world. They're gonna keep it on, okay with me? Uh, with you on that? Yeah. We stipulate that. All right, so how do we then figure out what Gildan is worth? Not what it, not what we should pay for it right now, but what is it worth as a business in a per share way? Okay, now we put some tools together for you guys and we've just, I think the website is almost there where it's completely free now. These are tools we've been using for, for several years for my own investing that make this a lot simpler. So if you're listening to this in your car, you're not gonna be able to go to your computer right now but you might want to later and just go get logged in on rule1investing.com. Rule1investing, just R-U-L-E-O-N-E investing.com. And just get a password and, and log in. No charge ever. And what we're gonna do with that website is cut through an awful lot of Excel spreadsheet number manipulation. We're gonna get right to it. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at let's start with guild let's start with apple computer let's just go to apple computer because it's fun All right so everybody knows about apple computer go over to apple computer and you're going to see that this has a score on it called a rule one score when you bring up apple computer okay are you with me so far i guess okay sure. you just it has you a score go over yeah. where it says type in symbol just type in apple and it'll come up okay so then you go over and you see a page called stock at a glance and it has a rule one score on it and you'll see that the scores are all green. Green is good, let's move on, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so we've done a lot of work for you there. Then go over to um, what's called the rule one chart. I think that's what we're calling it these days. Oh no, the growth rate chart, growth rate chart. So click on the growth rate chart and what you'll see are these four lines and just look at them and are they all parallel going the same direction all of the time? And if they are, 
That's the four growth rates looking good. Okay. If one of them is scrambled eggs, let's move on to a company where it isn't. You know, the line's bouncing all over the place. Let's just go with companies where they're all the same. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm a little confused about, I feel like we're sort of going backwards here. So we just spent like hours discussing these numbers. Yeah. And now you're just saying, oh, go look at some lo- pretty lines. Yeah. And you don't need to know what the numbers are. Yeah. I think I need to know what the numbers are. That's why I'm spending time on this. What are you talking about here? I'm just supposed to trust some score on your website? Well, okay, good. I'm glad you said that. So what would make it green, essentially, is that the numbers are good. Right. I mean, I get it. I just want to be able to check. Okay. So to check them... Trust but verify. Okay. To check them, go click on the little button that says rule one numbers. Oh, okay. (laughs) (laughs) I was getting very upset, Dad. (laughs) Sorry. I jumped over one there. (laughs) Check it and see that the numbers look good. (laughs) And it'll have all the numbers for every year. And then it'll have calculations where you calculate what a three years in a row look like and what a five years look like. It's going to calculate that all out for you. Okay, and these numbers that are on your website, where do they come from? They come from the filings from the SEC. Okay, so we can trust them. Yeah, they're good numbers. Okay. All right, so good point. So now we've, we've looked at the chart and we've looked at the rule number one. We've looked at the growth rate chart and we see that they're all parallel. Now go back to the rule one numbers and look at the, the actual rates of return, or sorry, the actual uh, growth rates on all of the big four numbers called moat numbers, okay? It's right there in front of you, you can't miss it. And look at the 10 year numbers. And you're gonna see on Apple that they're like 30%, 35%, 22%, 28%, whatever they are. What I want you to do is choose a number that's representative of the entire group. Okay, so one way to do that is to add them all up on the 10 year column. There's four numbers there. Add them up and divide by four. That's one way to do it. If you'd rather just pick a number, pick book value per share and dividend growth rate. That's a good number to rely on. What are we using this? And we're going to use it to figure out the value of this business. Okay. Because ultimately the value of this business is what the cash flow it's going to produce in the future. So we got to know how fast it's growing that. So we're going to pick a number here. And sorry, where, 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 what are we picking the number from? Ten year column. Of what? Moat. Of moat. So you look at, you go to the rule one numbers. Yeah. Look at moat. Yeah. Look at the 10 year column. You'll see. So call me crazy, but there's no line on financial statements called moat. No, there isn't. What is this number? These are numbers we compiled for you. Okay, so now you're saying I have to trust the rule one website. Is that right? No. So if you want to look at what they're compiled from, just scroll down the page a little farther and you'll say, numbers in detail okay. and it'll show you the growth rate every single year for all of the b- the big four numbers oh and that's what you're calling this moat number yeah we've compiled it into an average of over 10 years so that you don't have to just guess which number is the right number we're averaging okay. 10 years worth of numbers okay. so look at that and kind I feel of like see. I'm, uh, we just learned all of this stuff of like actual financial statement numbers and what yeah. they're called and now you're calling them different things like moat numbers what did i call them before big the big four growth numbers or yeah, the I growth rates so. i think so yeah but with those are those are numbers that help us determine whether the company has a moat or not okay right all right so we call them moat numbers yeah the big four growth rates yeah so the big four growth the book rates value I'm looking back at my notes. The book value, the earnings per share, the sales per share, and the operating cash flow growth rates. Perfect. And those all... You have decided to call those the moat numbers. Yeah, because those numbers tell us if the business has a moat. Okay. At least they tell if it's got a moat right now. We have to look out into the future and determine if there's an intrinsic characteristic that's going to protect that moat. But assuming we've done that, right, we're stipulating that already that it's a great business, then these numbers will give us a pretty good idea of what the road ahead should look like because it should be doing about the same as it's done in the past because of that intrinsic characteristic. So we call that moat. So why did those, uh, yeah, I mean, why did those numbers, why are you calling it moat instead of just sort of like 
good company numbers. <laughs> because I mean, Charlie... Right? Like, these numbers are showing the growth. What does that have to do with a moat? What does that have to do with a durable competitive advantage? Okay, great question. Well, a durable competitive advantage pro is produced by... It, what? Excuse me. What a durable competitive advantage produces is the ability of a company to protect its profit margins. Right. So somebody says, wow, that t-shirt company is making money like crazy. We need to be in the t-shirt business. You know, we're in the diaper business. We could be in the t-shirt business. Right. And so they're going to try to move in on your turf. And an intrinsic characteristic, a moat, is what keeps them from doing that. So moat is like the water around a castle. So it's just an image of something that keeps you from being attacked. Because um, my favorite example is Burlington Northern Railroad, right? You can't, if you own the railroad and somebody wants to come in and compete with you, they have to put in a railroad. But they can't get the track right away. Sure. So, so Burlington has an intrinsic characteristic that protects its profit margin. Okay, but how do these numbers indicate that in any way? These numbers happen because of profit margin. So right. the growth rates are dependent on, on a secure, non-shrinking profit margin. In fact, you're able to sustain your profit margins while you're growing the business, and that's where the growth rate comes from. If profit margins start to shrink, then every story you add isn't necessarily going to increase your overall growth rate mm -hmm. because your profit margins are shrinking like crazy because somebody's coming in and competing with you. Oh, so I think you're saying that somebody would have already done that and it would have shown up in the numbers if you did not have a durable competitive advantage. There you go. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I was I was missing. I mean, like, okay, Burlington Northern example, let's say in an imaginary world, anybody can put a railroad track anywhere. I don't see how 10 years of good numbers doesn't mean that tomorrow somebody lays a railroad track next to my tracks. It wouldn't. It wouldn't. Right. Okay. So what you're saying is that because no one's done it for 10 years, we can then infer that that means that nobody can or there's or there's enough blocking them no. from doing so. No. 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 What you can only do is you can, you don't have to infer, you see all these great numbers yeah. and you see they're not shrinking. Yeah. You, it's a fact that someone hasn't busted in there and put in new railroad tracks. Correct. That's a fact. But we don't know why. Now, understanding the business tells us why. Okay. That's so why Charlie's not, number one thing is yeah, yeah, yeah. you have to be capable of understanding. So I don't think these numbers really tell us if there's a moat. No, I what they tell us numbers, is there's been one. Yeah, exactly. Right. Okay, so fair and enough. And then we have to understand the business to see if it's going to continue. To see what's going yeah. Now, the key thing is that there's an intrinsic characteristic that's durable. So Burlington Northern's intrinsic characteristic is you you can't get right away. That's incredibly durable intrinsic characteristic. Abercrombie and Fitch has a brand on their jeans which isn't nearly as durable as Burlington's railroad rights. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah. So what we want to know is enough about this business to know what is the what is the durability of this intrinsic characteristic? Abercrombie's got a sexy brand and hires... And that's a great example because Abercrom Abercrombie probably did have, let's say, 10 years. They, they had a had good run. fabulous numbers. Of really good numbers, yeah. I bet, because they were so popular yes. for a while. Yes. And now they're not. And now they're not. And they're going down in real so trouble. So just looking backwards at those numbers doesn't actually tell us that they have a good moat. It doesn't tell, us, tell us that us the moat's still okay. Yes, there you go. Yeah. It told us they had a moat. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so that's the best we can do. Otherwise, again, librarians would be getting rich. Okay. So we have to understand the business well enough. So if we came over to Gildan, we would say, hey, is their price moat still intact? Do they still have all these relationships? Yeah, good. Okay, okay. solid there. If we went to Burlington Northern, hey, they got the railroad right away. Okay. Apple, huge switching moat, right? So we have to judge about how strong that, how durable is that in, intrinsic characteristic. And obviously a brand like Coca-Cola could be busted. I mean, maybe is busted, right? Coke's not making any money in America. 
Oh, really? Yeah, they're in trouble. I mean, they're making money. They're just not growing any mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at these numbers and you're going like, wow, growing, growing, growing. Oh, criminy, not growing. Whoa, definitely not growing. Then we see historically something's busting that moat. So a company where nothing's busting the moat, then we just need to be sure we understand the business well enough to be sure there's intrinsic characteristics that will keep this baby going. Okay. So these numbers are the growth rate numbers. Yep. They're the growth rate numbers. We call them moat numbers on the website. And as you very correctly have pointed out, I misspoke by saying that these tell us if they have a moat. They don't. They tell us they had a moat. Okay. Yeah, I don't love that name. It sort of confuses me. I think you got to get used to that one. It's a really commonly used name, and that's because Buffett the uses it. Moat. The, he calls it the moat numbers? Yeah, the moat. Well, no, he doesn't call it the moat numbers. He just calls it the moat. Oh. Right? He says... No, that's fine. I don't mind calling it... Oh, just you those, don't want to call it the moat numbers. Just those numbers. Yeah, I just want to I want to make clear, you know, what they're indicating. Um I don't, yeah, it, it indicates historical Fair moat. Fair enough. I can get historical moat. Okay. Yeah. I can get behind that. Yeah. And then the other characteristic that's right there in front of us is on the management numbers, which is return on equity, okay. return on invested capital. If those are staying solid, it indicates moat. And debt. And keep debt low. Look at me knowing things. You're doing good. <laughs> so if debt's not going up in the past, if ROIC and ROE are solid 10 to 15% or better, and not going down, if your growth rates are not going down, there's real good sign of historical moat there. Okay. Now, I go to, do I understand the business? Yes, these guys are the best pricing furniture store on the planet. Or, yes, these guys have secrets on how to do these drugs that nobody's got, right? Like right now, there's a company uh, called Gilead that has the patents on hepatitis C drugs. They have like 95% of the market. So you, you're looking for what's that intrinsic characteristic and how durable is it? So first we want somebody that's had one because if they haven't had a durable, if they haven't had historical moat, then God help us <laughs> as a novice investor figuring out whether they're going to have one. <laughs> Which is why I don't want to invest in IPOs, startups. Yeah. You know, they all talk a great game, but the proof is in the pudding. You know, let me see 10 years of moat. And that's what we shoot for. A minimum of 10 years of moat, historically. Historically. And then I can start to feel like, if I understand the intrinsic characteristic that gives it durability, and they've had this moat that's provable by these growth rate numbers, what we call the moat numbers, dang, then I'm really, I'm going to change the name on the website to historical moat. I think that's clearer. That's much clearer. Yeah. And, and it you reminds can see how you also to say, okay, what's the going forward moat? What's yes. the moat today and what's the moat yes. in three years and what's the moat in five years? And yes. is it all the same or is it going to change? Beautiful. Beautiful. So before we run out of time, I want to get to the margin of safety. The margin of safety. <laughs> because, but everything we've talked about is critical to getting there. And the actual steps are really pretty simple from this point. Okay. So first you look at these these historical growth rate numbers and you've determined that the moat is intact and solid, good intrinsic characteristics, and you pick a number that's reasonable for future growth, right? Now, how would you know the number is reasonable? Well, it would be pretty much what they've been doing in the past. Oh, okay. So that's when, when what you said when we first got off on this is you just choose like the average. Yeah, what's the average there? Okay. All right. What's the average there? And, you know, you, you it's a good place to start. What's the average there? Now, go click on what's called margin of safety button. Okay. Margin of safety. Click on that, and it'll take you over to a page where the margin of safety calculator is. And you will have an opportunity to put in the growth rate that you think is the right growth rate. Okay? But the calculator is going to pick a growth rate for you based on something else. It's going to pick a growth rate based on what the average professional analyst thinks the growth rate will be over the next five years. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to change that growth rate if yours is lower. Otherwise, leave it there. If yours is higher, if historical is higher than what the analysts are projecting, then you take the analyst number. 
If historical is lower than what the analysts are projecting, then you use your number. If the analyst number is lower than our number, does that Keep give it. you a moment of worry? No. What do you do? You trust analyst? <laughs> yeah, I trust <laughs> these take, guys. Are, do you take or trust is a strong word, but do you take it into account at all? Well, trust is a strong word, and and uh, we we take into account the fact that these guys have their reputations on the line to determine that number to be correct and so on. We also know they have a very short term horizon. It's not really five years. We also know that they are pressured by their their investment banking departments to not put a bad number up there for this company because the investment bankers are going to be like, you actually told people to sell this stock? Are you crazy? We're trying to get them to, we want to do the bond issue. <laughs> now they won't even talk to us because you told everyone. So you're fired. So there's a lot of pressure around so that So it's number. like you notice it and maybe you, maybe you think about it, maybe you don't. We're, we're at the novice level here. Yeah. So we're just trying to run a number just to get in the ballpark of reality. And if their reality is lower than your historical reality, I just want you to use their reality for right now. Okay. Later on, when you get better at this, you can use your number because you'll be more confident in it. But in general, the analysts are more optimistic than reality. <laughs> <laughs> so if their number is lower than yours, I guess I would, I would say, like, and you're probably going to find that out on Apple computer. Apple's 10-year numbers are going to give you a number like 30% growth rate. Mm. And the analysts are going to give you one that looks more like 14%. <laughs> oh, that's a big difference. But there's nothing to get upset about because you recognize Apple ha can't continue to grow at this enormous rate from 10 years ago and so on. So you understand why it's there. Okay. So, because we stipulated that, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you wouldn't be in this stock. All right. So now you have the the computer system itself automatically puts in the current earnings of the company. It automatically puts in the analyst growth rate, which let's just say we're going to use that one. Okay. It automatically puts in a couple more numbers that are used to figure out the future value of the business. And when you hit the button that says submit, what it'll do is create a, a, a what we call a sticker price, which is the real value of that business if those numbers are correct. So what it says is, if the analysts are correct about this business, using the today as a starting point, this business should be worth this today. And for Apple Computer, it might come in at, I don't know, $300 or something, right? Or $200. And so you see, oh, the value of this is $200. We call it the sticker price, like the sticker on the window of the car. Okay. Because right? you never pay sticker. <laughs> we always want margin of safety. So the real value of Apple is probably, let's say, it comes out at $200. Now you'll see immediately that the computer has, has calculated the margin of safety price, which is 50% lower than the sticker. So now it says, okay, this has got a margin of safety if you buy it at $100. Those aren't the accurate numbers on Apple, by the way. I'm just coming off the top of my head. But they're in the ballpark. So you can see, if it says it's worth 200 it tells you the margin of safety is 100, okay? And now you can just compare that to the price. And Apple sells today for, I don't know, 130 or something, or maybe 115. So you can see that the price is higher than the margin of safety that you would like to buy it at. The actual price. The actual price. Yeah. So what we want to do is insist on that margin of safety because we might be wrong about those numbers. And we want to be able to ultimately unload Apple without it losing us any money or any other stock that we buy. So we're going to insist that there's some kind of event and there isn't really one on Apple, right? There is, even if it looks like it's on sale, if there's no event from our point of view, it can't possibly be on sale because the guys aren't scared. They're not running out of the theater. So even if you think Apple's worth 200, I'm sorry, if they're not running out of the theater, then you're probably mistaken. Okay. So I think what we need, me and everybody else, is to know how you got that sticker price. Okay, shall we go so through a real calculation on that? Yeah, let's do it next time. Okay, I think, fair enough. I mean, I, I'm i glad Woo! your website exists. I'm glad it's that easy. I don't wanna have to rely on it. Okay, I'll take you through it so you can do this, but you're gonna need to be able to use Excel. I can use Excel. Okay, because there's, cal there, there's calculations in here. There's one calculation that requires you compound money, and that is, not simple to do without Excel and a formula. Okay. I mean, I think the important thing is that we just know how on earth how to do you're it. doing that. Okay. Sounds good. I don't want any mysterious gray areas. 
<laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> so the next time we're going to do this, we're going to we're going to dive more into these areas to make them not mysterious and try really hard to make them not boring too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and maybe the way to do that is we go through it once quickly and then we like put it up on our show notes or something. Okay, we're like gonna that. okay, let's do that. Because it's not interesting to talk about math. Oh my gosh, it's brutal. we just need the, the direction. That's why I just want you to go push the buttons and it'll spit out. Yeah, numbers. but we just need the But you the need to know the behind it. Yeah, yeah. You need to know that. Yeah. Okay. Well okay. then that's what we're gonna do. Okay. Time to go play. All right. <laughs> All right. Bye See everybody. Ya. Hey you guys, thanks for listening to Invested, the rule number one podcast. If you like us, please subscribe. Please and leave a review for us on iTunes. Uh, by the way, you can get our notes and links for this podcast and post comments about this show and uh, also get more information about how to invest on your own by going to investedpodcast.com. Um, by the way, everything, this is important, everything discussed on this show is either my opinion or Danielle's opinion and it isn't to be taken as investment advice because I am not your investment advisor nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. This podcast is for entertainment and education only. I, I got to tell you, I really hope you enjoyed it. And I know Danielle does too. So until next week, it's time to go play. See ya.